So yeah, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jeff Ching, and I'm uh, a software engineer at Google, working on the Google Cloud Platform. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we build and have built API clients at Google, and specifically about how we get that process to scale. Um, so yeah, I work for Google Cloud Platform. You may or may not have heard of the small product. Um, but even more specifically, my team is officially the Languages, Optimizations, and Libraries team. Um, and we're responsible for language infrastructure. So that includes compilers and runtimes, uh, analysis tools and libraries, um, and a whole lot more. Uh, some of these tools are for Google developers working on internal Google products. Um, but a lot of our work also goes to support um, languages for cloud services um, for external developers like all of you. Um, but today we're really going to focus on the intersection of languages and libraries here. Um, so what are we going to cover? Uh, so first we'll try and describe what the problem is that we're trying to uh, solve here. Uh, we'll take a look at four case studies on how we've attempted to solve this in the past um, and how we currently are attempting to do it. Um, and then finally we'll talk about some stuff that you guys can do as uh, API producers. Um, and some of the stuff we won't cover. Uh, we're not going to cover uh, how to scale your individual application um, or even design a single API. Um, instead, we're really going to focus on the, the building client libraries to consume those APIs. Um, and as we're going to talk about APIs, and we're going to talk about these acronym a lot, uh, we're really talking about network APIs here. Um, and so in this case, uh, we're, we're going to talk about uh, uh, application programmer interfaces that are inter operating across a network of computers, uh, communicating across network protocols like HTTP, and are frequently produced by different organizations than the ones that are consuming them. Um, and this is from our design guide glossary. Um, and it says frequently um, with regards to being for, ex for a different organization, but this will also apply to internal APIs if you're in, say, a microservice architecture. Um, OK. Um, so what's the problem that we're trying to solve here? Um, if we're just building client libraries, can't I just write my own and call it a day? Um, it's, it's not rocket science to read the developer docs and just write some code. Um, um, okay, so let's, let's write a, that single API client by hand. And in this example, let's say I've written it in Ruby, because that's what I had experience with before, and maybe we're using that in the back end, um, and that's what I know. Um, but a customer comes in and says, oh, I, I like your product, um, but do you guys have a Java client? You know, we're using Java for whatever reason, um, and we love to use your services. Um, so we go write that Java client. And then we get another customer that says, oh, I want, how about Go? Uh, and so very quickly, we need to support a bunch of languages. Um, and we may or may not have language expertise in those, in those languages. Um, so uh, next product is going to come up with, it comes up with this great new idea, um, and it's a new service. And it also has an API that we need to support. Uh, and another, and another. And so quickly, this can get out of hand. Um, you can even consider each row of this matrix to be um, an API change or a, a new feature that's added to a single API, just because you have to propagate that change across all of your API clients for every language. Um, so now we have X APIs that we need to support and Y languages. Um, and so we have to maintain and build X times Y client libraries. Um, and even if a developer can handle more than one, you, know, you still have O of X times Y you know, developers. And that's, that's a lot of developers. Um, so now imagine trying to tell your boss, yeah, we want to support Elixir, um, but we'll need X more developers and six months to add it. So clearly this entire process doesn't scale. Um, and we'll need to find a way to multiply our efforts. Um, so at Google, we've experienced this at a much greater scale and this, experienced this pain um, than most other teams will ever have to deal with. Um, and so we've learned quite a bit from this. Um, if you just consider our public APIs uh, that are available that, in all the versions, uh, we have over 250 APIs. And so uh, that number even balloons to thousands if you consider our internal APIs that our internal developers use. Um, so our way of attacking this problem is through code generation. Um, or we're going to call it CodeGen for short. Uh, just code that writes other code. Um, and you know, you're probably doing CodeGen right now without even really realizing it. So every time you generate a new Mix project, if you use Mix New, you're doing CodeGen. Um, or even macros are another type of CodeGen built right into the language. Um, it's just functionality that's there to make these repeatable steps um, into a trivial amount of work. Um, so why did we decide to do CodeGen? 
Um, there's a couple reasons. The first is for scalability. Um, obviously, once you've built the first version, the second, third, fourth, and fifth, and, and, and beyond, uh, should be trivial. Um, second one is for leverage. Um, it's even better if you can utilize tools that the community has already built um, to do whatever you're trying to do. Um, and it's, it's just part of the open source development model. Uh, if you build on top of tools and contribute back to them, it's going to save everyone time and effort. Um, the third one is consistency. Um, and uh, what happens is when you do code gen, all your API clients will look and feel the same across the board. Um, so an example of this is like, within Google's code, you know, there's thousands of RPCs available. Um, so if you know how to set up and call any single one of them, then you know how to call any of them. Um, and so if we go back to our example of where we're handwriting all of our API clients by hand, um, you know, if each are developed individually, uh, you could initialize and configure each one slightly different ways. And it's just going to add some cognitive load and developer pain. Um, you know, we're creatures of habit, and we want that consistency um, uh, and repeatability when we're, when we're writing this code. Um, and the last one is going to be safety. So you know, writing new code is bound to have, is gonna, bound to have bugs, um, including security ones and others. Um, you know, through iteration and shared tools, we can quickly find those bugs, iron them out in one spot, and then they're fixed across the board. Um, so going back to our picture, uh, now our previous matrix is now a linear scaling version instead of polynomial. Um, and these boxes are a little bigger just because there's more upfront costs when doing this. Um, but you, still, you only have to write it once, and then it just scales um, for, for all, all the APIs. Or just, you get them for free. Um, so yeah, so great. We're down to just O of Y developers based on the number of languages. And uh, we'll, we'll see that this is actually definitely the upper bound because you can always decide how much um, effort is required if you want to support longer tail languages. Um, so before we can talk about how, how we multiply the, the efforts, uh, we need to understand what it takes to build a single API, um, API client. And so what are the building blocks that make up one of these clients? Um, so we can kind of break it apart into three different components. Um, and each of these are co generally composable pieces that you can mix and match um, an option from each category. Uh, so the first is going to be the API description. So this is what the data types are, you know, the structures that match your, your domain or business logic. Um, then you have the endpoints, which are you know, what RPCs are available, um, and how do you route to them? Uh, what are the available parameters and responses that you're going to get back? Um, and to describe these, there's, there's many formats that are possible. Um, I'll just mention a couple. Uh, OpenAPI is one. Uh, Google's published our own called Google Discovery. There's RAML, Protobuf, Thrift. Um, even you, can, you can consider GraphQL also as an API description. Um, the second component is really the, is the transport of protocol. So that's really the how of how you're going to communicate with the service. Um, so most commonly, a lot of people are writing HTTP REST and JSON APIs or XML, um, or even you know, binary protocols like gRPC or uh, Thrift is another example. Um, and the last component is authentication. And this often goes hand in hand with the, the, you know, the transport model. Um, and so a couple examples are you know, HTTP basic auth or OAuth um, or public private keys for doing encryption. Um, so now that we have these basic, uh, three basics out of the way, um, let's see how this played out for Google across the years. So our first uh, case study is going to be one of Google's first forays into providing API clients for languages. Uh, so let's go back to 2011. And uh, you know, we're imagine we're the developers at Google. Um, and we're feeling the pain of trying to provide API clients for all of our APIs. Um, and so we've, we've, we've made a decision that we're going to automate, automate this process. Um, so first, we've got to figure out how we're going to define our APIs. Um, and we decided on a new API uh, version called Google Discovery Docs. And we're going to publish them in a new service called the API Discovery Service. Um, so if you're, not just, if you're not familiar with this format, it's a JSON format. Um, and it was describing RESTful, um, a RESTful API. And it was resource-based. So you'd be defining objects with methods on them um, or methods on collections of objects. And this was really the paradigm of how the APIs at the time were designed. So at the time, let's, let's think about what the goals were of this project. So the first was scalability. You know, at the time, there were dozens of APIs, and it needed to work across the board for all of them. Um, we wanted to automate everything. Um, and 
beyond just the API clients, we wanted to generate other stuff as well, like documentation, um, or even other tools that could consume this, like the API Explorer. Um, the API Explorer was a tool where you could actually go in, browse through all the APIs, build up fake requests in the browser, um, and it's all just based off of the discovery doc. And the third goal was transparency. And so we really wanted to show the source of truth for the APIs. Previously, the APIs were all based off of undefined specifications, but we published client libraries for them. And so if you wanted to figure out what the API was actually doing, you'd have to go into the source, you know, dig through, see what the request response were, um, and it just wasn't clear to developers. Um, and so yeah, we really wanted to show, like, this is, this is the description of our, what the APIs can accomplish, and here's everything you can do with them. And so these three goals came straight from a presentation from Google I.O. in 2011. Um, and of these three goals, scalability was the, like, the primary driver here. Um, so this is a simple diagram of how these client libraries were composed. Um, so we have our definitions kind of embedded into these uh, client libraries. Um, so we, I call them dynamic cl uh, client APIs because um, we'd be reading the discovery doc at runtime. So basically you'd be feeding in the discovery doc uh, to a generator that would then, at that point, build a service and models. So kind of like a, a factory for service objects. Um, so in theory, you could point to the latest version hosted on, you know, on the Google website um, and get the latest version of the code. Not that I would recommend that. Um, but you could do that in theory um, because the, the code was generated dynamically at runtime. Um, the transport for all these services were HTTP, JSON, and REST. Um, and for authentication, we used OAuth keys and or API keys. Um, and it was all contained in a single API called Google API Client. So this one library could handle every single, um, every single API that we had. Um, and this is kind of how you might, some pseudocode for how you might have used one of these libraries at the time. Um, so you read the specification from a, a JSON file, uh, you would build You'd build an API builder for that service. Um, you'd get that sp a specific service within that API. And then maybe you make an RPC call for inserting an object based off of, um, uh, with an RPC call to the service. Um, so it's really a lot like kind of building up reflection at, at the time. Um, so it's a story. So when this, when this first came out, I was working in, in a Ruby startup. Um, and in the Ruby community, the developer experience and the readability of code is paramount. Um, and so the first version of the Ruby API client was one of these dynamic ones. And it was really off-putting just because you open it up and you, try to, you want to see what's in there. You want to see how it's working. Um, uh, and you, you really couldn't dig into that. Um, you have to just inspect the models it was generating and hope for the best. So pro tip, uh, avoid this kind of metaprogramming or dynamic client generation. Um, it's kind of cool you know, as, an ex as an exercise. Um, and you totally could do it. Um, if you, in Elixir, you could completely just define a module and use one macro and pass the entire discovery format to that and have it generate the, the entire API client. Um, but the key there is you, know, you, you could do that. Um, and technically, it'll work, but it's just not as developer friendly. Um, so for macros and metaprogramming, there's a certain point where it becomes unreadable. And at that point, you know, you've probably gone too far. So how did, how did this client API work out? Um, so functionally, they worked out really well, or they worked okay. They worked out. <laughs> um, but the, the dynamic nature of these libraries uh, was not developer friendly. Um, and so from our, our goal slide, you know, one of our goals was transparency. And our API definitions were transparent, but the generated clients were not. Um, and so we can do better. Okay. So case study number two. And so I'm going to call this one the, the static API clients. And so this was for uh, code that was generated up front. And this was very soon after these first dynamic clients. Um, and so this was also originally used for uh, languages where that, that dynamic uh, generation wasn't as feasible. Um, but we also switched to this um, from the, the dynamic ones um, 
because of usability and readability. And this is what the latest version of these client libraries currently do. Uh, so in contrast to our first attempt where we uh, would generate these models at runtime, instead we do all the work up front and output, some, uh, output the actual source files of these libraries for developers. So you could see the, doc you could see the code, you could see the documentation, um, you could see what you're using. Um, so we still use our discovery format for this um, because at the time those, that, that format was still uh, successful. Um, they were still the same APIs, so they were still HTTP and JSON, um, and still same kind of auth. Um, but we actually had this internal tool that would take the, the discovery doc and then output uh, the, client, the client libraries. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they were internal, so they were not open sourced, and you couldn't take on um, community fixes. Uh, the final artifact was still a single library that contained all the code you needed to talk to any of our APIs. So how did this one work out? Um, uh, it worked out well still, and it scaled. Um, and for many APIs, it's still the only official libraries that are available to interact with them. Um, um, but because it was a closed source pipeline, you really couldn't take advantage of the community. So if there were bugs in the generator, all you could get was bug reports. The community could not come back and say, oh yeah, I, I can see what the bug is. I can help you fix this. Um, uh, it turns out these libraries are still not as developer friendly as, as they could be. Um, and one of the reasons was that they lacked the higher level abstractions that you might expect from a nice client library. Um, so for the third case study, uh, we'll take a look at our current generation of client libraries. And so uh, these ones started around 2014, and we're going to call them the cloud APIs on uh, Google Cloud Platform. Um, and so for this iteration, we targeted our newest APIs first, and they are our cloud APIs uh, for machine learning and other cloud tools. Um, and we really feel that this form, that, or this version, is state of the art for our code gen. <clears throat> so what were the goals of this project? Um, the number one goal for these libraries was not scalability to begin with, um, but it was to provide a great developer experience. Um, a developer should be able to look at the generated code um, for, each, for each library, and it should feel, it should feel right for that language. Um, and if a developer likes using that library, then they're going to use the products. Um, we also want each of these APIs to work performantly, um, and be idiomatic for the language that we're supporting. So um, all of our new cloud APIs have a lot of shared features. And one example of that is, or a couple examples are pagination or batching or long-running application, or long-running operations. Um, so for pagination, our APIs have a common pattern of returning a chunk of data and then a next page token. And then to get the next page, you make the same request, but with that next page token. Um, but because we know this is common behavior, uh, we can kind of hide that implementation from other people by you know, providing something language idiomatic, like a stream generator, or just the ability to loop over everything in the entire list. And you don't even want to have to care about that it's making all these extra API calls to get each page. Um, you know, and to accomplish this, we'll allow some kind of minimal hand handwritten layer uh, on top of these clients, if that's what it takes for the best experience. Um, and again, yeah, we'll highlight that you know, the, great the great developer experience was the, the number one goal here. Um, so going back to the general structure um, of how we went with the initial Google APIs, you know, we thought we, we can restructure this to be better than this. Um, so rather than generating the entire library, instead we can reduce the surface area of the generated code, um, which will simplify the entire process. So, our other supported code can go into some common shared library that's shared between all the APIs. So next pro tip is to minimize the surface area of any kind of code you're generating. Um, so if you, if you add logic to your, your generator, it's going to be harder and harder to fix and find those bugs. Um, if you can put the, those edge cases or shared handling into a, into a shared common library, um, those will be consistent across all APIs. They'll be easier to find the bugs and fix them in one spot. Um, and so, yeah, so this is generally how each of our Google Cloud uh, libraries are composed. Uh, and we feel like this, is, this library structure is state-of-the-art for CodeGen. 
And so a little more in details here. Um, so our API definitions um, are in protobuf and, and also have configuration on the side. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with protobuf, um, what it is is you're defining messages, which are like data structures, and RPC calls, um, which are like, you know, which are methods. Um, so where discovery docs were based around resources, um, these APIs are more focused on RPCs. Um, and as a design goal for these libraries, instead of trying to, trying to massage that into resources, we're actually just gonna try and expose them as RPCs, but just in a language idiomatic way. Um, and so, yeah, so going back to these, the protobuf here, um, they're actually the same protobufs that are used to power the service on the back end. Um, and so that's going to be able to make, ensure that um, whatever service is handling that request is the same API that the developers are expecting. Um, and unfortunately, these protobufs are private because because they do power our internal services, and some of the services have unreleased features or stuff in alpha um, that aren't publicly available yet. So, so these, these protobuf ones are not quite, are, are not public. Uh, for transport, uh, these libraries use gRPC, uh, which is an open source RPC framework, uh, which utilizes HTTP2 and protocol buffers. Um, gRPC, can utilize some pretty cool features like two-way communication and streaming, and can be more performant than HTTP and JSON. Uh, for authentication, we handle OAuth 2, and a, another layer on top of it called service accounts, uh, which are some kind of, it's a way for us to define role-based authentication. Um, the generated code goes into a, a sub-library called ProtoClient, so that's just the generated code. That's just the, the data structures and the endpoints. Um, and so yeah, all model definitions and routing go here. Uh, this library could be contained in each individual library, or they could be in an external shared library as well. Um, and so each, extra each language also supports a common library, and we call that one GAX, so that's Google API Extensions. And this is where all the, the shared code goes for pagination and batching and long-running operations. Um, so GAX, gRPC, and the auth um, are all handwritten libraries. And so that's, you know, that's a lot of work that has to go up front. Um, another note about GAX is it also helps kind of glue things together um, by tying together the authentication and setting up connections. Um, some of the common stuff for just initializing your, your APIs. Um, and to glue it together, we, all, we use an open source tool called Artman, which you can find on GitHub. And I'll have a link later. Um, and we actually have an additional small layer here. Um, so for some of the languages, we could have a handwritten layer for higher level interfaces. And, um, and these are meant to be idiomatic for each language. So, Example for this would be like in Elixir Erlang, if we have, we have a logging service where you can send logs to. Um, but in Elixir Erlang, we probably end up implementing a logger behavior. Um, and so these are really like the one-offs for each individual API. So another example would be like PubSub, where you just want to have some kind of process that's going to just loop over messages from a topic, and you don't really care about the API calls. You just want that higher level abstraction. Um, and yes, these are one-offs, and they don't really belong in that shared library. So they're going to live with each individual handwritten layer. And the result is a developer-friendly API for develop, developer-friendly library for each API. And so they're versioned independently, released independently, and you can pick and choose whichever one you want to import in your product. Um, to add a new API, all you need to do is define the API, run code gen, and then write a thin layer and publish it to, to a package manager. So how did these, these libraries turn out? Uh, I think they work out really well. Um, and these are currently still in progress, so the, you know, we still want people to try them out and give feedback. Um, but the general consensus is that it's a great developer experience and people like them. Um, but you know, some of the challenges of this project are you know, the full code generation pipeline 
uh, was not developed in open source. So we still have open source tools. We still use Artman. Um, but the templates that we use and all the configuration that, is, that feeds into there is still not open sourced. And that still means no external uh, contributions to the generator, um, but something that you know, could be investigated in the future. Um, another thing is like the configuration options can grow really fast. Um, and so as soon as you add a configuration to your code generator, um, if you don't set up ground rules, uh, the, the number of combinations can just be exploding, right? So if you have options that are per, per API, um, you can very quickly get out of hand. Um, and just as an implementation detail for the code generator, it, it was, it's a very monolithic uh, code, code base. And so um, it's really hard to make contributions to it without understanding the entire code gen code. OK. <clears throat> so this fourth case study is probably the one that most of you are probably most interested in. And this is the Elixir effort at Google. Um, and so this is a really a test program for how easy it would be to add <clears throat> additional languages um, to Google Cloud. Uh, can we find a way for developer, to enable developers to use our platform and APIs without spending up an entire, entire big team? Um, so some of the things we need, we need a runtime for our platform or the service. We need client libraries. Uh, we need to create tutorials and examples. Um, and so this case study is really about how we're able to provide client libraries for Elixir for all of our APIs. Um, so a question you might ask is, you know, if, the, if the pattern we described in the last section was state of the art, then why are we going to try and change it? Uh, and the reason why is because, because of, um, we want to try and minimize the amount of work, or see how much we can do with fewer resources. Um, so first, let's see how, much, how many resources it took to build those cl cloud APIs. Um, so, and this is all per language. Um, so the high, the high level interfaces and just managing the open source projects takes about two to three full-time engineers. Um, we have one or two full-time engineers just working on the code gen pipeline um, and templates for each language. And a whole other engineer working on just the protocol, so gRPC and protobuf. So that's, so that's, you know, that's four to six full-time engineers working on this. And so we really wanted to see how much we can do for languages um, with a smaller team in this. Um, so given that we're going to have a constraint for how, much, how many resources we're going to have, um, we kind of need to scope down our goals for this project. So, um, so given this constraint, we're OK with APIs wor working well and a good enough developer experience. So that's kind of you know, subjective, but um, we're OK with good enough. We don't need it to be as good as like a handwritten layer, because we know we just can't do that without handwriting stuff. Um, we want to demonstrate that this is possible for any kind of language, so that you know, anyone could build something else for, for Erlang or Rust or any other language as well, um, and all with open source tools. Um, so perhaps we can inspire um, others to do this, to help us build this for other languages. Um, and lastly, you know, if Elixir continues to grow, it should be possible to take what we've built um, layer some stuff on and graduate to treatment just like our other um, APIs. Um, so in my, in my personal opinion, I think this, the, demonstrating, the, that, the fact that we're demonstrating that it's possible is the most important goal of, of all of these. Um, and so if we can inspire people to do this for Erlang or other languages, um, then that's awesome. Um, uh, but so yeah, so given our constraints and the fact that we want to make it so anyone can do it, we want to um, lean more and more on open source tools and standards. OK. So back to our CoGen diagram. Um, so to simplify it up front, we're going to do away with the extensions library. Um, and so we'll end up going back to our, our, previous, um, our previous format, where we, we're going to generate the API client, the entire API client with CoGen. Um, so next pro tip. Uh, define your goals and define what you're trying to accomplish with your client libraries. Um, so in our case, you know, we're defining that we're going to have this constraint on resources. 
Um, so we had to figure out how to get the most bang for our buck, um, while also having a plan for the future, uh, given more resources. Uh, so in the future, you're going to have perfect hindsight vision. Um, but if you record your goals and motivation, then you can be confident that uh, you did the best you could at the time. Okay. So now we've got a smaller design for this. Um, for our API descriptions, we picked OpenAPI v2. Um, and if you're not op uh, familiar with OpenAPI v2, um, it's either JSON or, or YAML format. And it's a way of describing RESTful APIs. And it's really, oh, it's really an effort to be able to describe any REST, RESTful API. Um, so why v2 if there's a v3 available? Um, uh, we picked v2 because uh, the tools are ready for it. Uh, v3 tools are still a work in progress. And as of last week, there still wasn't, still wasn't a release date for v3. Um, but when the tools are ready to support v3, we'll switch over. Um, so we also don't yet publish our API v2 specs uh, directly. So instead, uh, we'll convert them from our discovery format. Um, so not all of our APIs support gRPC yet. And so we wanted to support all of our APIs. Um, and so to do this, we're going to fall back to HTTP, REST, and JSON. And to use that, we'll use the Tesla library to help us build clients. Um, so for authentication, we'll support OAuth and service accounts. Um, but rather than write our own library here, we decided we could leverage the community. Um, luckily for us, someone in the community uh, has done a lot of this work for us. Uh, we found uh, the Goth library for Google Auth. Um, and that's an open source tool written by Phil Burroughs. Um, and he just wanted to use Elixir on Google. So, he built that, open sourced it, and so we can, we can leverage that tool. Um, and to tie it all together, we picked the Swagger CodeGen project because it did have uh, 40, language, 40 plus languages already built. Um, and there was, there was already a Elixir template, but in our case, it wasn't quite descriptive enough. Um, so it modeled API calls and uh, parameters, but it didn't define any structures or definitions. There was no documentation. Um, so what did we do? We, we contributed fixes back to the project, and now the templates are way better. So if you use the generator now out of the box, you're going to get a pretty good looking, uh, pretty good looking client. Um, so pro tip, use and contribute to these existing code gen tools. Um, you're you're going to benefit from the work, and uh, you can even help others and future you. Uh, so story of how this helped me out personally. Um, uh, I was at our, lo our local Ruby meetup um, in Seattle, and it was a workshop night. And what we were trying to do is we were trying to build an algorithm for talking to a, a REST service. Um, so of course, I'm at a Ruby meetup, so I, I want to use Elixir. You know? um, and I had just published these Elixir templates. So rather than you know, building the HTTP library component, instead I defined the open API v2 version, or API v2 spec for that server, um, and just plugged it straight into the code gen and, and built my library. Um, uh, one of my friends who, was, who actually wanted to use Ruby uh, used that same open API spec that I generated, plugged it through the, the same code gen, but used Ruby. Um, and so we were able to focus on building the, the, the rest of the algorithm without the nitty gritty details um, of interacting with the server. So yeah, we open sourced all these tools on GitHub uh, and we're able to publish each library independently. And so, yep, so we've built 106 client libraries, and they're all published to hex um, with very, very little, very, with limited resources. So that's pretty awesome. Um, uh, a little more on the, what the libraries look like. You know, we have individual libraries. We use Tesla. Um, so auth is actually pluggable. So some of our APIs, uh, they, they all use OAuth. Um, but some, some APIs will require three-legged OAuth where you're authenticating on behalf of someone else. Um, so you just can use the OAuth2 um, library directly. Um, but really, the interface is just plugging in uh, an API, an OAuth token. Uh, so what are the results of this? Um, well, most APIs work. Uh, we, we still have ran into issues on some of them. Um, it's a good enough developer experience. Uh, 
and we do have a passwordful support. So you know, being able to add on an extensions layer uh, in the future is something we can do, or even handwrite uh, idiomatic interfaces. Um, so just a couple of the challenges. Uh, I'll just go over a couple of them. Uh, ugly generated code. You know, if you're, if you're doing code that generates other code, it's bound to be, it's kind of ugly. Um, uh, so yay for the Elixir core team with mixed format in 1.6. Uh, so we just pipe our code through uh, mixed format afterwards. Um, and it'd be a lot harder if this was like Python, where uh, white space matters. It's hard for templates. Um, but uh, definition accuracy uh, is how much you trust your API definitions to be correct. If they're out of sync, they're not going to work. Um, and also, if the definition language is good enough to describe your API. And so we actually found that OpenAPI v2 had an issue with multi-part uploads, where it wasn't descriptive enough. So that's why we're kind of waiting for v3 for a few of our APIs that require multi-part uploads. Um, and testing is hard just in general, but generating tests for hundreds of libraries is even harder. Um, and so I don't have a great solution here, but um, I can describe it in more detail if people have questions. Um, and so some of the things we'd like to add, those idiomatic interfaces, uh, obviously they have to be handwritten. Uh, the common library, it will simplify our code process. Um, and even publishing our API v3, open API v3 specs directly. Uh, so what can you do as an API producer? There's three things I want you to do now. Uh, define your APIs. Um, second is generate your API clients. Sooner or later, you're going to need to scale your API client generation um, for either your external developers or internal developers. So just get a head start now and start generating libraries. Um, and third is uh, use and contribute back to these existing tools that are out there. Uh, you help other developers and future you. So, so that's all I have. Thanks. That's a good question. Um, I actually haven't, I don't have first-hand experience with that. Um, but so in the case where we're generating the whole client with CodeGen, that's going to be a harder problem. Um, if you do have that shared library, a lot of times you can kind of defer that memory management to the shared libraries and give you helpers to help you manage that. Um, I don't know if that answers. All right. Well, thank, let's thank our speaker. Thank you.